Obi Desert or the Sahara Desert. But actually, the biggest desert in the world is in Antarctica. It's the Antarctic Polar Desert, and it's out there in the middle. And in the wintertime, when the sun goes down, winds can get up to 200 miles an hour, and the temperature can drop 129 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Very cold, very dark, and it's very dry. It only gets about 2% precipitation, or two inches of precipitation in a year. But strangely, it is sitting on top of 70% of the world's fresh water. It's just all frozen, yet it's a desert. You know, the Bible in Revelation talks about a time when the world, again, is going to be cold and dark. Stay with us. We're going to talk about it in this presentation of Revelation Now. <laughs> Good evening, friends. We'd like to welcome you all back to Revelation Now. Everything is about to change. We're about halfway through the series of presentation dealing with some very important Bible prophecies. And we'd like to welcome all of those joining us across the country and around the world. I'd like to remind you, if you missed any previous programs, you can find them at the revelationnow.com website where they're all archived. So we'd encourage you uh, take a moment to look at that and uh, bring yourself up to speed. We're getting into some very important and uh, very deep prophecies of the Bible from here on out through our series. So it'll be helpful to get a background by viewing those archive programs. We'd also like to remind you that these presentations are being translated live into Spanish as well as uh, sign language for the deaf. And if you'd like more information about that, again, revelationnow.com. Or if you'd like the Spanish one, it's Revelation Now Latino, and you'll be able to get more information there. We'd also like to greet the many people who are joining us from countries around the world. Uh, we've been contacted by folks watching in Fiji, Abu Dhabi, Argentina, Ghana, Austria, Rwanda, Singapore, South Korea, Barbados, Vanuatu, Norway, Bolivia, Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, Venezuela, Panama, Spain, Ecuador, Cuba, Belize, and Indonesia. And of course, that's not all of them, but those are the ones that have contacted us and saying, hey, we're here, we're watching. So a very uh, warm welcome to all of you. Uh, we got a testimony from Roz from Jamaica. He says, I am blessed by these meetings. They are amazing. And Chris from South Dakota says, thank you for these meetings. My friends in Canada are being inspired by each of these presentations. So Greetings, Chris and Roz. We are glad you're part of the program. Uh, and then we got a picture that came in from a family in the Philippines. We got the uh, Lamongo family, and they're watching, all three of them, and they're participating in our Revelation Now series. So if you have a picture of your family group, or maybe if you're part of um, a group that's meeting, maybe in a church, uh, send us a picture. You can upload the picture at revelationnow.com. Tonight's topic is entitled... The Devil's Dungeon. And we have a lesson that goes along with the topic. It's uh, one of our landmarks of prophecy studies. It's entitled The Devil's Dungeon, and this is available to you for free. You can download the lesson at the Revelation Now website, just revelationnow.com, as well as our free gift. Our gift is entitled Satan in Chains, and we'll be happy to send you this little book. If you'd like to receive it, you just need to text the word chained to 40544 if you're in North America and you'll receive a digital download of the book or otherwise if you're outside North America again it's available at the revelationnow.com website and it's free you can download the book and we encourage you to do so you can read it share it with your friend it goes along with the topic that we're going to be looking at today I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward and we will prepare for looking at a fascinating study we're talking Pastor Doug about that 1,000-year period that we read about in Revelation chapter 20. Yes, and very important to understand because it uh, affects the concept that so many people have about last-day events. Mm -hmm. Well, before we get to it, as we always do, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you once again that we're able to be here, and thank you for help and strength and the opportunity to gather together and open up your word. And so we ask your special blessing as we delve into the last book of the Bible, and we look at a very important passage in Revelation 20. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, Pastor Ross. And once again, Pastor Ross will be joining me again immediately after our study and our presentation. And we'll be answering your Bible questions. So we'd encourage you, if you have Bible questions on the subject tonight, then you can Facebook, send them on in to us, and we'll be delving with them uh, in our time after the program. Well, we're going to be studying today the theme of the Devil's Dungeon, which is based on Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to be basically covering that whole chapter that talks about some of the last day events dealing with the millennium. But we were very interested to kind of get out on the streets and ask the average Americans, what do you think or what do you know about the millennium? So here's some of the responses that we received. What I think about when I hear about the millennium is all of the many times throughout my long life where people have thought that the millennium was coming and they were wrong. Satan would be bound into the bottom pit for 1,000 years. With the, why they call it a millennia. It'll be peace on earth, the, the sheep will lay with the lamb, and there'll be a lot of peace. But after he's let out of the bottom of the pit, like I referred to earlier, then he's going to cause havoc again upon mankind and upon this earth. I believe that we uh, who have a relationship with Jesus will uh, be raptured. In other words, we'll be taken up with him. Um, and then after a thousand year reign, a millennium, then he will come back. What's the most important is humanity, like how we treat each other and what we're doing to, to be better people, not just to ourselves, but to others around us. I mean, I, I don't know any more than that. Well, in accordance to the book of Revelations, they said the thousand years is when Shaitan or Satan is going to be released to the earth. You know, I'm not sure, but I think that last gentleman was videotaping our cameraman as they were videotaping him. So he could share the interview with his friends. A lot of different perspective, different uh, comments about the millennium. We're going to find out what the Word of God has to say. And before we even delve into the lesson, I'd like to just set the background by opening our Bibles together. Go to Revelation chapter 20. And I won't read the whole chapter, but I'm going to read the first segment of this. Revelation 20 verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, until the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or their hands and they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And that's the first section. We're going to be covering all of that. And uh, hopefully we're going to take what to some people think is a difficult subject and, and simplify it. Now, the Bible stories are the key to understanding Bible theology. The Bible stories are there as the key to understanding some of these complex prophetic issues. Revelation, once again, is a kaleidoscope that is pieced together from a lot of other Bible stories. We're going to go back to the beginning. And I want you to just know that in the Garden of Eden, when God first made paradise, everything was good, good, very good. The ground was so lush and vibrant and fertile, it produced just so many exotic fruits that we can't even imagine. And man had to do very little in the way of work. He did work, but it was very pleasant. It wasn't grueling. But then after sin, and man was evicted from the Garden of Eden, God said, and you read this in Genesis 3.17, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. So something happened. The earth wasn't going to be quite as vibrant and productive. Then you get to Genesis chapter 4. And well, God told Adam in Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of your face you will eat bread. Then you go to Genesis 4, and after Cain killed his brother, the curse was even furthered for Cain. It said, when you till the ground, 
it will henceforth not yield unto thee her strength. And then, of course, even after the flood, the, the earth and the ground and farming became even more difficult because it seems like the natural vitality was diminished. So by the time Israel came on the scene, God told the people of Israel through Moses that they were to farm the land for six years and then let it rest on the seventh year. It was like a seven-year Sabbath. And give it a chance to kind of regain its nutrition and you would basically leave it fallow and it would sort of heal itself and develop more vitality and the organic material would build up the soil. You know, I, I know about the uh, end of the 19th century, uh, George Washington Carver became famous because he showed a lot of the plantation growers that they were just, they weren't able to produce the cotton anymore because cotton took so much nitrogen out of the soil. He said, you've got to plant other things like sweet potatoes and peanuts. And they said, what are we going to do with peanuts? He said, I'll think of something. <laughs> he thought of a lot of things to do with peanuts, including asphalt. He had all kinds of things he invented. But the whole idea was those were crops that would put nitrogen back into the soil and build it up. God knew the ground needed to rest so that it could recover and retain its vitality. Well, for a little while, the Jews followed that law, but as near as we can tell studying Bible history, it was largely forgotten. He told them, the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. The, whatever came up volunteer, the poor were allowed to glean. But they kept harvesting year after year, and they neglected to let the land rest. So God said, look, if you're not going to let the land rest, I will make you let the land rest. Finally, after 490 years of disobedience, they were carried off to Babylon. The Bible tells us that they burnt the house of God. This is the Babylonians burnt the temple of God in Jerusalem. They broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burnt all the palaces thereof with fire. Notice this, is 2 Chronicles 36, 19. A very important verse. And then that escaped the sword, he carried away to Babylon. Now, don't miss this important point. The people that were in Jerusalem that didn't escape the city, they were destroyed and that city was burnt with fire. Those who were spared and shown mercy were taken off to Babylon to that golden city. Remember, we studied Babylon was like the golden city. And they were able to then come back after the time in Babylon, which was 70 years. It says, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. This is the part I wanted to underscore. Until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years, or we would say 70 years. So while the land around Jerusalem was desolate, nobody was in the land, it tells us that it was keeping Sabbath. You can read Nehemiah 1, that during that time it says, the walls of Jerusalem also are broken down, the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now when we go to Revelation, and we start reading about this 1,000 years in Revelation. Keep in mind that the Bible says a day with the Lord is like a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years are like a day. And we know that God works on a principle through the Bible of six days you work and one day you rest. There's going to be a 1,000 year period of time when the planet rests and recovers from the curse of sin. And it is going to be desolate during that time. And so you stay with me, friends, and I think you're going to see how this all fits together and makes perfect sense as we go through it. And I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. It'll be in your lesson. I hope you're using the lessons. You can download them for free. If not, take some notes, and you can look these things up. All right, so we've got question and answer to study the subject of the millennium. Question number one, what events mark the beginning of the 1,000-year period of time? Well, you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And there the Apostle Paul tells us, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ rise first. So the Lord is coming down, and uh, the dead are rising. This is obviously a climatic moment in history. This marks the beginning of the 1,000-year period of time. We just read about this in Revelation chapter 20. It says, they live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And it said, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. The dead in Christ rise first. So that's the starting point for when this thousand years begins. The coming of the Lord, the resurrection, those of us who are alive and remain being transformed and caught up to meet the Lord in the air, sometimes called a rapture, but it's not a secret rapture. Everyone's going to know when that happens. 
the rest of the dead, Revelation 20, verse 5. Now wait. If the dead in Christ rise first, who are the rest of the dead? The wicked. You've only got two choices. Once you've taken the good out of the equation, you've only got the bad. There's only two categories. Jesus said you're either with me or against me. You're saved or lost. There are two roads in life. You're on the straight road on the way to heaven, that straight gate, or you're on the broad, and they call it Broadway, you're on the broad road to destruction. So the rest of the dead don't live until the thousand years are finished, which, what does that imply? After the thousand years are finished, they do live, right? It says this is the first resurrection, meaning those who are raised, the first resurrection when Jesus comes. What else will happen at the first resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52, we will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. You know, I used to wonder what that word incorruptible meant. It means we then have these glorified bodies that do not get old and decay and corrupt. But we've got immortal, eternal, vigorous bodies. And we're transformed. And it, it doesn't happen slowly like a butterfly. It happens instantaneously. And the Lord can do that. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The Bible tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, meaning our regular flesh and blood bodies, they get old. That's not the body that inherits eternal life. But more about that to come. Who will change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So if we're wondering what kind of bodies do we have We've got bodies like the body that Jesus had when he rose from the dead. Now, he had a glorified body that was, let me back up and say this differently. God made Adam and Eve with real bodies. They were meant to live forever. But they ate and they worked and they were able to uh, rest, not because they were exhausted, but it was a, it's a pleasant rest. And they're real physical bodies. God is going to accomplish his original plan plus an upgrade. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost that fourth dimension that we will call the spiritual side of their nature. See, right now, wherever you are and here in the studio, there are angels here, probably good and bad. There's angels all around. Uh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and uh, rulers and heavenly places. And so uh, there's a spiritual realm that we don't see. If our eyes could have the veil removed like the servant of Elisha, we would see the hills are surrounded with chariots of fire. But when man sinned, that sense, that spiritual sense was destroyed or damaged. We're going to have bodies that will be physical and spiritual, but these are glorified immortal bodies that have powers and abilities that we just don't have now. But they're real. When Jesus rose from the dead, he ate, he said, touch me, see that Flesh and blood doesn't, uh, uh, that a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see that I have now. And it says, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the brightness of his coming and uh, the Lord is going to burn up then the wicked and, uh, when he comes. So when Jesus comes, when the resurrection takes place, when we are transformed, we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air with glorified bodies and reunite with the saved who are the dead in Christ, at the same time, what happens to the wicked? This is at the beginning of the 1,000 years. The wicked who are alive, it says they're destroyed by the brightness of his coming. You got one group that says, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. And then you got the other group and uh, they flee from his presence, calling for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them and hide them from his face. And then the whole creation sort of implodes at that time when Christ comes. The earth is, it's in bad shape. It says, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And notice what else? Every island fled away and the mountains were not found and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Now this picture of a hailstone that you see, I understand someone sent this to me yesterday and it is from Australia. And it looks to me like it's a five-pound block of hail. And I know the gentleman, and uh, th that's one example. There's some big hailstones. I, I heard that the biggest hail on record 
was softball sized, but that looked softball sized to me there. And it was in Pakistan and it killed people. You read about the hail, one of the plagues of Egypt. It killed man and beast that were out in the field. But this hail that's coming says every hailstone is the weight of a talent. That would be approximately 75 pounds by today's measurement. So you got the earth quaking, mountains are being swallowed up, the dead in Christ are rising, those who are alive are being caught up to meet the Lord in the air, the wicked are fleeing from his presence, trying to hide in the surface of the broken earth, being killed by the hailstones that are pummeling from the sky. And at that moment is when the millennium begins. We read in Revelation chapter 20, it says a, an angel. Now this is an angel that's got to be more powerful than Lucifer now and many suspect this is, might be Gabriel, it's the angel of the Lord. He comes down and he lays hold on the dragon. It calls him the dragon and the serpent. Who is that? That's Satan. And he's got a great chain in his hand. Now, when we talk about Satan and chains, when we talk about the devil's dungeon, these are kind of metaphors. Uh, I don't think you can handcuff the devil uh, because it says we don't wrestle with uh, flesh and blood. And we don't use carnal weapons in fighting the devil. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual, but they're mighty to bring down those strongholds. He grabs that old serpent that is the devil and Satan, and he binds him for a thousand years. Satan is bound. Where is he bound and how is he bound? And this is where a lot of people misunderstand. I'm going to spend a few moments on this. It says that he's bound in the bottomless pit. That word in Greek is the word abusos. You've probably used the word before, the abyss. It's the same root word. And you, you find that word, for instance, if you read in um, the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, that was translated even before the time of Christ, when it talks about God making the world in the beginning, it says the world, the earth was without form and void, and it says it was abusos. It describes the earth as abusos. If you read in the Bible when Jesus was talking to the devils, when this demoniac man was possessed there by the Sea of Galilee, he asked him what his name was, and, and they uh, said, our name is Legion, for we are many, and they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. See that word there, deep? It's exactly the same word that you find in Revelation translated bottomless pit. Now, I remember when I first read this in the Bible, I thought, Satan is cast into a bottomless pit. And, you know, baby Christian, I'm reading the Bible, I'm taking a lot of this stuff literally, and I'm trying to picture a bottomless pit. And I remember going to Carlsbad Caverns when I was younger, and uh, if you've never, anyone here been to Carlsbad Caverns? Yeah, it's really something to see. I wish I could have discovered it. Discovered by a 15-year-old boy named James White, Jim White. And he thought he saw smoke coming up out of the hills. And he got a little closer and it turned out it was a vortex of bats. And there were so many of them that they darkened the sky. And he thought, I got to check this out. Very brave <laughs> young man. Made a barbed wire ladder with some fence posts and barbed wire. Climbed down himself with nothing but you know, a primitive torch, began exploring. He came back several times and ended up being sort of a guardian of Carlsbad Caverns the rest of his life. Well, when they were taking people on the early tours of Carlsbad Caverns, they had kind of a, a walkway they developed to keep people somewhat safe, and they had this one precipice with a big old gaping hole, and I've been there, and they called it the bottomless pit. And the reason is they said, watch this, and they take a stone, they throw a stone over the side, and go... I said, it's a bottomless pit. Somewhere, China, it came out the other side or something. I don't know what they thought. Well, after they got equipment that was more sophisticated, they, they climbed down. And I forget what the depth was. It was like, you know, 200, 300 yards down. They found the bottom, which was filled with this very fine limestone dust and a lot of little pebbles. <laughs> because what was happening is the pebbles were going, <whistles> poof. But they didn't hear that. <laughs> and so they thought it was bottomless. Well, of course, bottomless pit, you know, what is that, a black hole? Where is the Lord putting the devil? That is the same word, abusos, that was used to describe the world when it was first created in its chaotic condition. It means the emptiness. These demons that said to Jesus, do not cast us into the abusos. It means the emptiness with nothing to possess. See, even in the time of Christ, it says it was there because they said, don't cast us there. See, the devil's a workaholic. 
If he has nothing to do, it drives him crazy. Well, he's probably already crazy, but it really makes it difficult for him. And the way that the devil and the demons manifest themselves is not by, you know, haunting houses. I mean, what devil wants to get excited about possessing a two-by-four? It's not, that's not what excites them. What excites them is manipulating people and animals, living creatures. And when they are cast out and they have nothing to possess, they even said to Jesus, don't cast us out of the man into the buzos. Let us go into the pigs. At least they're alive. We can do something with them. And so uh, yeah, Jesus actually let them go into the pigs and they all ran off the cliff. So Satan, when he is bound in the bottomless pit, he is bound on this world with nobody to tempt or manipulate for a thousand years. Now think about it. This all makes sense. Where are the dead in Christ when Jesus comes? What direction do they go? They go up. What about the dead who are wicked? What happens to them when Jesus comes? They're staying dead. There's no resurrection for them. It says the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years are finished. Um, and the living in Christ, where do they go? They go up. The wicked who are living when Jesus comes, what happens? Destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So how many people are alive on earth when Jesus comes? After he comes, I should say. Nobody. So what has the devil got to do? You know, the Bible says that when Christ comes, the heavens depart as a scroll. The sun goes dark, the moon turns to blood, so the planet is cold. It's not going to be global warming. It's going to be global freezing. The planet is cold and dark and desolate and it's covered with destruction. Let's just take a minute here and look at some of the verses that deal with this. Question three, who will be raised in the second resurrection and when will that take place? The rest of the dead, we've discovered they're who? They're the wicked. They don't live again until the thousand years were finished. Which means that at the end of the thousand years, they do come out of the graves. It says... They that are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good, the resurrection of life. Now notice Jesus says there's two resurrections. This is, by the way, John 5, 28 and 29. They that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. It's going to be like the zombie apocalypse at the end of 1,000 years. All of them are going to come out of the graves. And someone says, well, Pastor Doug, it's pretty clear that when Jesus comes, the righteous get immortal glorified bodies. But if the wicked... When they're raised at the end of the 1,000 years, you know, they may have been in pretty bad shape. What kind of bodies do they get? Not exactly sure, but I just suspect God's going to put them back together enough so they know what's going on. And if you come out of the grave and your back still hurts, that doesn't bode well. You're probably not in the right resurrection. <laughs> you're you're going to have uh, the old body <laughs> is what that would mean. So what is the condition of the earth? What condition will it be left in during this 1,000 years Sabbath? when the earth is resting, it's desolate, the Bible says, after the devastating earthquake and the hailstorm that begin the 1,000 years. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. He makes it waste. He turns it upside down. The earth is utterly broken down. Now, Isaiah, is he talking about something in the past or is he looking into the future? Notice, he's talking about what the earth is going to look like during the millennium in the future. I beheld the earth, Jeremiah 4, 23. Now, when you first read this, you're going to think you're in Genesis. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Sound familiar? But keep reading. And the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and there was no man, and the birds of heaven were fled. Now, the picture is they were once there, but they're gone now. I beheld on the fruitful place was a wilderness, a place that was once fruitful is now a wilderness, and all the cities are broken down. It's not talking about Genesis. All the cities are broken down. Why? At the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. The Lord says he will come and he'll make an end, but not a complete end. So here, Jeremiah is describing a time, a condition, when the, the world is empty. All the cities are broken down. There is no man on the earth. Let me give you more verses. I know this is new for some people. The slain of the Lord shall be in that day from one end of the earth even to the other. They will not be lamented or gathered or buried. You know, typically after a battle when there's a lot of slain, some family or some agency comes in and they take care of the bodies and they bury them out of sight so life can go on. But 
here it says there'll be a day. I know it's not a pretty picture. But there's going to be a day when the slain of the, or, of the Lord cover the earth from one end to the other. No one to lament, mourn, or bury. By the way, I, I didn't put any slides in on this, but you read in Revelation 19, it talks about the Lord calls all the birds of carrion, the eagles and the vultures, to the feast. And it's, a, it's they're talking about the feast of the carrion. And it's describing a time, often after battles, when the slain would cover the fields, the sky would grow dark with those birds of carrion. They often talk about this. You remember what um, Goliath said to David? He said, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to feed you to the buzzards. I'm paraphrasing. And uh, David basically said, no, it's going to be the other way around. <laughs> But that was a common sight. The sky would grow dark with all of the, the birds of carrion. And here it's saying the whole earth is covered. And it says, the Lord says, come to the birds and eat the flesh of captains and great men and mighty men because the whole earth is covered with the slain at that point. They're not lamented, gathered, or buried. Where will the saints be during the 1,000 years and what will they be doing? Jesus said, I will come again. Let me back up. You all know this in John 14, verse 3. It says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I love this promise, I will come again. He promised that. He's going to keep his word. I think it's very soon, by the way. I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you might be also. Now I just need to pause. Take a breath and explain why this is such an important issue. There are uh, two competing views on the millennium that do not, you can't reconcile them. One group, and this is, it's a fairly new theology, meaning in the last 150 years or so, they believe that the millennium is going to be spent here on earth, that what will happen is the rapture will be a secret. The church is caught away, but life continues to go on here on earth during those seven years of tribulation. Then after the seven years of tribulation, then Jesus comes back with the saints. And then the saints are here on earth ruling over the wicked for 1,000 years. And I would not want that. I don't know who would ever think that'd be good to rule over the wicked. Satan is somehow bound, so I guess it's not as bad. But we've got glorified bodies, but the wicked don't. So I guess they keep having funerals, but we don't. It just doesn't seem to make sense. And in that scenario, this is the left behind Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye scenario. And you know, I don't question the sincerity of these men. I just respectfully disagree because in their scheme of last day prophecy, they've always got someone alive on earth. They don't have a place for all these verses that say that the earth is, is desolate, that it's resting. And Jesus said, what direction do we go when he comes? He says, I go, I'll come receive you unto myself that you may be at the mansions he's prepared, the place I've gone to be. And so we clearly go up when Jesus comes. It says when Jesus comes, the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. The slain of the Lord cover the earth. You, you can't reconcile those two ideas. So we do not spend the millennium on earth. We spend it in heaven. I'm going to give you more verses on that in a minute. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. And they live and reign with Christ a thousand years. Well, there you have it, Pastor Doug. The righteous are reigning over the wicked. I don't want to reign over the wicked. What does it mean that we're reigning? Well, Jesus is the king of the universe. We were made in his image. He has not only redeemed us, but we are going to be living in the capital of the universe with the almighty God, reigning with him over all creation. It's not the kind of reign where you have a despotic king. It's a reign of love. And so the idea that we're going to be bossing around the wicked during the thousand years, that's not my idea of heaven. Living and reigning with Christ and extolling his goodness and love to all the unfallen creatures. Now that is an exciting thought. It says they will be priests of God and of Christ and reign with him for a thousand years. This is Revelation 20 verse 6. It's going to be up in heaven. So where is the sea of glass? Here's the key that will help us understand this. Now, I don't have a slide on this, but I'm going to take you in, in our Bibles. And uh, I think I marked this ahead of time so we can try and find it pretty quick. In Revelation chapter 4, I'll start there. And you'll see that, and then we're going to go to Revelation 15. Here's the key. Revelation 4 verse 1. 
After these things I look and behold a door standing open in heaven. Where? I need the help of my studio audience because I know there's a, a lot of people studying along with us out there. And I want to make sure that we're all tuning in and keying in on these things. A door is open in heaven. And the first voice was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up. What direction? Come up here and I'll show you things much which must take place. So he's going to heaven. He sees this throne of God and the 24 elders. Go to verse 6. Behold, the throne, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. All right, so there's a sea of glass like crystal before the throne. Now we're going to go to Revelation 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven. This is Revelation 15, verse 1. Great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is the wrath of God complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have gotten the victory over the beast, over the image, over his mark. Now the people who have to get the victory over the mark of the beast, have they lived in the past or is this still present and future? That's a, talking about the last days, isn't it? Mark of the beast. So these are the people. Where are they? Sea of glass. I saw them on a sea of glass. Those who had gotten the victory over the beast and his image, over the mark, over the number of the name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. So when Jesus comes, it says we go up. We just read that. We go up to heaven. We're on the sea of glass. These are the ones who have gotten the victory. We're not down here. And so... Uh, just wanted to emphasize that point. And what are we doing? 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Do you not know the saints will judge the world? Do you not know, 1 Corinthians 6, 3, that you will judge angels? Now, what does this mean? First of all, uh, I want you to divest yourself of your typical idea of what judgment means. In the uh, typical American Western mind, if I say picture a judge, Okay, if you were to close your eyes and picture a judge, what color is his robe? Black. Black. What's he got in his hand? A gavel. a gavel. See, we're all united on that. And what's he doing? Guilty. Innocent. Guilty. Innocent. Right? I just, so, you know, you picture a judge going around. He's just always declaring people guilty and innocent and saying, 40 years, you're free or whatever, the penalty. And the, in the Jewish mind, judgment didn't mean that. You've probably said before, they're a person with good judgment. That doesn't mean they walk around going, guilty, innocent, innocent, guilty. It means that they're evaluating. They've got good evaluation skills. So when it says that we'll be judging, now when we're in heaven, isn't it pretty clear that, if, that we're caught up to meet the Lord when he comes, we're saved. And the wicked, they're lost. So we are not deciding, which is probably a good thing, we're not deciding who is saved and lost. That's already decided. But we're going to have a lot of questions when we get to heaven during that 1,000 years. I've got 1,000 years of questions. And uh, for one thing, <laughs> someone said there'll be three surprises when you get to heaven. Surprise number one, you're there. Surprise number two, there are some people there you never thought you'd see there. For example, you've got... Uh, Stephen gets to heaven. I just always try to picture this. I think that'd be, you know, Stephen the martyr. And he gets to heaven. He's just rejoicing. And he's with his angel. He's giving him a private tour because he's a martyr. He's got special rank, you know. And, and then he sees a parade. And he said, what's that? And he said, oh, that's, they're, they're taking Saul on a parade because of all. What? Stephen, last time he saw Saul, he was killing Christians. And I can just picture Stephen saying to the angel, you know, I don't want to embarrass you guys. You usually do really good work, but you've made a mistake. This guy's not supposed to be here. I mean, don't you know, he was, he was the hit man for the, the Pharisees. And, and they'll say, oh, glad you asked, Stephen. Come with us. And I used to say, they're going to go look at the video together. I can't say that anymore. And then I would say they would go look at a DVD, but that hardly works anymore. Now I guess you're just going to download with fiber. But anyway, so he'll come to the, the library, and God's got, everything's on record. And those things that, you know, every idle word we speak is recorded, the Bible tells us. Everything we've done is recorded. And so he takes him to this heavenly library and says, let me show you what happened. He shows Stephen, Paul, on the road to Damascus, that dramatic conversion, the repentance of Paul, three days weeping and crying over what he had done. He forever had remorse over what he had done to Stephen. The angel said, Stephen, your last prayer was, do not lay this sin to their charge. God heard your prayer, forgave Saul. 
You go, oh, wow, what do you know? And so there's that surprise that there's people there you never thought would be there. And then the third surprise is some people. You'd say, where's Deacon Jones? I want to say hi to Deacon Jones. And the angel says, ah, I've got some bad news. Come with me if you want to know. Uh, Deacon Jones looked really good on the outside. But, uh, you know, he always hugged his Bible walking around and smiled real big and he could sing the loudest and said, but uh, he had some secret sins. The Bible says those things done in secret will be shouted from the housetop. And you go, oh, because suppose you've got a loved one that's not there. And God wants you to love and trust him. If they're not there, he wants you to know that he did everything he could to save them, but he had no other choice. And so he's going to let us look at the record books to show I wanted to save them more than you wanted them to be saved, but I had no choice. Based on my law and the gospel, that's what I had to do. So God, we're going to be looking at and judging, evaluating the judgments of God. That's at least part of it. And it says you'll judge angels. Well, the saved angels, we're not judging them. The wicked angels, we're affirming that judgment. And that'll make more sense as we continue with the, the lesson. What will happen at the close of the 1,000 years? It says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, and his feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. You know, Jesus said to the disciples, I'm going, I will come again. The angels told them in Acts chapter 1, this same Jesus will come back in the same way you've seen him go. He left the Mount of Olives, one Bible uh, version says, or one gospel says, Bethany. Bethany's on the Mount of Olives, so it's the same place. And uh, he's coming back the way he left. So at the end of the 1,000 years, the Bible tells us he comes down, his feet touch the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. By the way, that is the most expensive real estate for uh, a cemetery in the world. Every Jew wants to be buried on the Mount of Olives because of this Old Testament <laughs> verse. They want to see the Messiah when he comes. And it will cleave. It splits. And it forms an enormous valley. Don't think Grand Canyon. I'm talking about a valley that's going to be 300 miles across. Because into that valley, the new Jerusalem sits down. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So who's in the city? The redeemed, Jesus, the good angels. This has been the dwelling place of God. He's bringing it to our world and it is going to set down on the very territory that encompasses the promised land. So everything God told the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this land is going to be yours and your descendants forever. Is God keeping his promise? It's all the, the whole border, the extended big border that he gave in his promise to David and Abraham of the promised land will all be contained within the walls of the new Jerusalem. And we're in the city. So this is at the end of the 1,000 years. What happens next to free Satan from his prison? Well, why was he in prison? Because he's a workaholic and he had nothing to do. He was bound by circumstances. Can, can you imagine that, that devil? He told all those uh, other angels, he said, if you trust me, I've got a better plan than God. Just trust me. We're going to win. And during that 1,000 years, they're probably chasing him around the planet going, we listened to you. We lost eternity because of you. And he's got to listen to that. And uh, finally, at the end of the 1,000 years, the city, uh, the world that's been dark is illuminated because the Bible says the city is as bright as the sun. You remember our study on that. It comes down, it illuminates the prison, and Jesus, when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, he calls forth all the dead who have ever lived. Kind of like a big hypodermic needle coming into the planet. The New Jerusalem coming down, Christ says, come forth and all the wicked who have ever lived through the ages, it's going to be billions, will come out of their graves. And when that thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loose from his prison. Now he has a vast number of people to tempt and manipulate once again. He goes back to work and he's got all this pent up energy. What will Satan do when the wicked are raised? He will go out to deceive the nations that are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. And I think I've got... Uh, 
a verse here that talks about Gog and Magog. I'm not going to read that one yet. If you have your Bibles, those who are watching, you might have one here. If you're with me, you turn to the book of Ezekiel chapter 38. And I want to just highlight a couple of verses. Remember, well, who are Gog and Magog? I know I've got some dear friends that say, well, that's Russia and China. There's nothing in the Bible. It says Gog and Magog from what? The four corners of the earth. It doesn't say just north. It's talking about something global. You find Gog and Magog mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. They were ancient enemies of God's people. Please remember this and Revelation will make a lot more sense. All of the proper names in Revelation are symbolic. It talks about Egypt. It's not real Egypt. It talks about Sodom. Sodom's gone. It talks about Balaam. Balaam was dead. It talks about Jezebel. It's talking about the characteristics of these people, not literally them, but they're famous in the Bible for their deeds. Gog and Magog. Gog, or rather Magog, simply means from the matrix of Gog or out of Gog or the children of Gog. So it's saying Gog and its children. It's like Babylon and her daughters. Herodias made her daughter dance. You can read about Jezebel and her daughter Athaliah all persecuted the prophets of God. And so it's like the, this leader and their children. That's all what Gog and Magog means. They were the ancient enemies of God's people. They represent the wicked of all ages that have been fighting against God. It says, uh, let me see here, Ezekiel 38 verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Roth and Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against them. Can't read all of chapter 38, but I want to go to verse 16. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud. What word did I say? Like a what? A cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days. When is it going to happen? And I will bring you against my land so that nations might know me that I am hallowed in your eyes, O God, before their eyes. Then go to verse 22. And I'll bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him and his troops and on the many peoples who are with him. So it's not just him and his troops, the many peoples, other nations. All the tribes will mourn because of Christ, the lost. I will rain down on him flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Well, has that happened in the past? No, so this is a prophecy of the future, isn't it? And you've got to read the whole chapter. It's amazing how this unpacks Revelation for us. So the devil, what did we just read? Cover the earth like a cloud, numbers like the sand of the sea. The devil sees this vast army, all the wicked, billions, who have ever lived are brought forth from their graves. And he said, you know, there's a lot more of us outside the city than there are of them inside the city. And someone said, hope springs eternal. I guess that's even true of the devil. He thinks, maybe. He doesn't give up. You know, uh, I remember this uh, story about gal worked at an office and she was a Christian and she worked with an atheist and he was always pessimistic and negative and she was always positive. And he'd come in and he'd be saying, oh man, the weather, it is awful. It is raining cats and dogs. She said, oh, they're going to be beautiful flowers later. No matter what he said, she always had a positive spin on it. It used to drive him crazy. One day he got an idea. He thought, I got her. I knew she can't say anything good about this. And he came in and he said, oh man, the world is uh, full of so much misery. That devil, boy, he's just really awful, isn't he? She said, well, he certainly is busy. The devil is a workaholic. He is busy. <laughs> he doesn't stop. And so as soon as he sees that he's got people to manipulate, he tries to rouse them. Now, who does he have in that group? Does he have some military geniuses? Probably Alexander the Great. You know, he kind of drank himself to death. I don't expect he's in heaven. Uh, Napoleon, uh, Great military leader. I did not include Hitler because he wasn't that good a military leader. He was just a motivational speaker. But uh, so you've got these geniuses and you've got uh, all of the science from the people who lived before the flood and the last days and, and they take whatever resources in the world and they say, let's make weapons and let's launch an attack on the city of God. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and they compassed the camp of the saints about. What is the camp of the saints? The New Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. It's the New Jerusalem. And it says, they surround the city, the beloved city. We know what it is. And I want to pause here. Uh, this is what you call a cliffhanger. Station identification. All right. We've been studying the millennium. What does milli mean? It's a thousand. 
annum, years. The word millennium is not in the Bible. The teaching is. It's called the thousand years. You don't really find the word Trinity in the Bible. I'm not sure you find the word Bible in the Bible. I think the word Biblos is in the Greek. But um, so it's a teaching that talks about this thousand year period when the earth is desolate. Let's review where we are so far. The millennium begins with the first resurrection, Jesus coming, the wicked are destroyed. A thousand years we live and reign with Christ in heaven during that time. And then at the end of that, when the new Jerusalem comes down, the wicked are raised and the devil tries to get them to launch an attack upon God's people. This is again Ezekiel 38, 16. Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. The Bible says the number of them is like the sand of the sea and even Revelation uses the word cloud. Can you imagine? Right now we got 8 billion people in the world. Unfortunately, most of them are not saved. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And they're going to surround the city of God and the devil is going to infuse them with his own enthusiasm and power. You know, he's a powerful angel. And say, we can take the city. See, last time they saw Satan, he was impersonating Christ. And uh, he's going to say, I'm the rightful owner of that city. Those folks are the ones who took it from me. But we can take it back. I will give you powder. Follow me. Trust me. And it's, they're desperate. It's their last hope. And they cover the earth. At this crucial moment, what will stop everything? And I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So just as they're getting ready to launch this attack on the city of God, Christ is elevated above the city, sitting on a white throne, and the glory that emanates is brighter than the sun, and the power, it just makes everyone freeze. The, the power of God is so awesome that um, all they're going to do, it's like, you know, when the fire came down from God in the days of Elijah, what did Israel do? They fell down on their knees and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. They saw the power of God. When he gave the Ten Commandments, the people cowered. They said, Moses, don't let God talk to us anymore. When Christ in his glory rises up on his white throne, there's a, everyone freezes in their place. And this is the time of what you would call the great white throne judgment. And uh, during this time, the Bible says everyone is judged out of those things that are written in the books. And if our names are not in the book of life, then we will be cast into a lake of fire. That's coming in just a moment. But uh, when we think about the judgment, when it talks about the white throne judgment, I used to have this idea, God's going to line up everybody who ever lived in a very long queue. And he's going to say, okay, one by one, let's get the books and uh, get the witnesses and testify. You get defense attorney, prosecuting attorney, and who knows how long one case might take. If it was America, uh, it'd be a long time. I mean, there's some people here that are clearly guilty, and they're on death row for 20 years. And, uh, but that's not how God's going to do it. Follow me. Can the Lord save 20 people at one moment? At Pentecost, were 3,000 saved in one day? 5,000 a few days later? Can the Lord judge millions at a time? He can. As everyone stands before the Lord, uh, in a panorama in the sky, the Lord is going to show the plan of salvation and how he has done everything he could to save every individual. But they could not, they would not participate, they did not surrender, they did not trust him, and they're not saved. And their deeds, the places where, in great detail, where they were led the right way and they turned against God is going to become clear. I think there's going to be people outside the city. They're going to look around them and they're going to say, I'm here because of you. I'm here because of you. Why did you mislead me? And the people outside the city are going to look up on the walls and see the redeemed. And they're going to say, oh, that's the one I persecuted. <laughs> they're in the city and I'm on the outside of the city. It is going to be the time of mega reckoning for everybody. We've always said, you know, vengeance is mine. God says, I will repay. There is a day of justice and judgment. Now, I don't know exactly how long it'll be. But I think everybody is going to be coming to terms with the secrets of life at that time. We're going to be coming to terms with the people that we treated right and they're in the city because of our proper influence and our love for them and there'll be people we'll have to look at that are outside the city because of our influence. 
But there'll be a day, notice this, this is the grand finale. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25, the day is coming when like a shepherd, I will gather all nations before me, the sheep and the goats, the good angels, the bad angels. One group on the right hand, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. The other group into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So after this judgment is complete, what happens? As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue confess to God. This is the time when everyone outside the city, inside the city, they're going to see the justice and the goodness of God in this whole plan of salvation. They'll confess to God. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, everything above, and things in earth, everyone below, and things under the earth. Every creature will bow down. That every tongue, does that mean the tongue of the saved? The tongue of the lost. The good angels and the devil and even the bad angels, the devil, probably against his inner desires or his pride, he is still going to be compelled to acknowledge God was good. Jesus is Lord. See, the devil said to Jesus, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you the world. Jesus said, I'm not taking it from you that way. I'm taking it by my blood. I'm going to redeem them. And now instead of Jesus revering the devil, the devil is going to fall down and recognize and revere Jesus. And I heard a great voice of many people in heaven declaring, true and righteous are his judgments. So what is it that we're declaring? We're declaring his judgments are good. This is what it means when it says judgment is given to the saints. We're going to declare that God is fair. What happens next? Well, what happens next? Before the fire comes down, as we just read in Ezekiel, Satan still, as they get up off their knees, he said, follow me. We can take the city. It's our last chance. He still can't stop himself. Now, I might, I might just pause here and try and answer a question you're thinking. Why does God go through this whole charade of giving the devil another chance? Why, why doesn't he let him just be destroyed or judge him when he comes? Keep in mind, the whole universe and unfallen angels, they once loved Lucifer. Uh, he had lived maybe eons before his fall and rebellion. Maybe a million years. We don't know. But God is getting ready to destroy the highest creature that ever lived, that was ever created. God is demonstrating even after Lucifer has a thousand years to consider the results. He's walking around this broken, desolate planet. He's looking at the results of his rebellion. He said, my government will be better. And he's, all the angels said, yeah, really, look. Even after all of that, he can't change. He's lost all redeemable qualities. God is going to say, before I rain that fire down, I want everyone to know I had no choice. Satan, once again, tries to get everyone to launch attack against God. And they all probably turn on each other, and they try and turn on the, this great confusion. And finally, God executes what you call the third phase of judgment, the executive part of judgment. The sentence is passed. Fire comes down from heaven and devours them. This is the fire and brimstone we just read in Ezekiel 38. And as that fire rains down, it creates a lake of fire. And everybody is punished according to what they deserve in that lake of fire. And he who did many things is beaten with many stripes, so to speak. Few things, few stripes. And so there are varying degrees of punishment. Satan is going to suffer the longest. It says at least day and night until he's all gone. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, this is the strange act. God does not like casting the lost into the lake of fire. But keep in mind, the Bible describes this as the second death. Does the world burn forever? No. Let's review what we've learned. Millennium begins, first resurrection, second coming. During the thousand years, we live and reign with Christ in the city. It's like a thousand-year Sabbath. The earth is a desolate during that time. At the end of the 1,000 years, you have the second resurrection. The holy city descends, and this great judgment takes place. During the millennium, the righteous are in heaven. The earth is desolate. After the fire goes out, what will God do for his people? For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. And I saw a new heavens and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth were passed away, 
and there was no more sea, no big barrier separating. We, according to his promise, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, we look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And this is the point where God says he will, Revelation 21, he will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Where will God and the righteous finally live? Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. Friends, this is just, a, a, I think, a beautiful study. It shows the justice of God. It shows the culmination of the plan of salvation, how God is going to do everything he can to save as many as he can, but at some point, he has to purge sin from the universe. There'll be no more devil, no more demons, no more wicked sinners. All things are made new. Everyone will be punished in the lake of fire according to what they deserve. And then on the ashes of the purified planet, God makes a new heavens and a new earth where there's no more pain, sorrow, death. All things are new. He wants you to be part of that kingdom. But if you're going to be part of that kingdom then, he wants to give you a new heart now. And you get that by coming to Jesus just like you are. And he can transform you and give you that new birth. We're all going to meet again someday. I hope that you want to be inside the city, friends, when that day comes. Jesus has paid your ransom. He paid your fare to get you inside the city. You need to accept that by faith. Invite him into your heart and let him create you into a new creature. He will do it. Let me pray with you before we go to our question time. Loving Lord, we thank you for this encouraging study that there is coming a day when there'll be no more sin and there'll be no more suffering and that all things will be made new. There'll be no more devil. And Lord, we're glad to know that the universe can enter eternity purified from all pain. And I pray, Lord, that we can have that experience. Be with each person watching. I pray for some who have not made that decision that right now they'll say, matter of fact, they may pray with me at this moment. Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. Forgive my sins. I repent of them. Give me a new heart and begin to show me through your word how to live for you. Amen. Now, friends, if you prayed that prayer, I hope that you're going to go and download the studies that we've been sharing, especially the one on salvation. Don't go away. Coming back with Bible questions in just a moment. Have you always wanted to be a Bible expert but never knew where to start? Are you searching for answers that will bring you joy, peace, and fulfillment? Then you'll love the Amazing Facts Storicals of Prophecy Bible Study Experience, now available in 18 languages. Featuring 24 easy-to-read lessons, the Storicals are packed with Scripture and step-by-step -step guidance that will give you absolute confidence about what the Bible actually says about the Second Coming, the Rapture, the Antichrist, and the Mark of the Beast. You'll also get the truth about hell and the afterlife and practical insight about grace, salvation, and how to truly live like Jesus. Even better, it's absolutely free at storicals.com. So don't miss out. Get started on your Bible study adventure today at storicals.com. To all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Through radio, television, print, evangelistic events, and the internet, Amazing Facts International is heeding the call of Jesus to go into all the world. Millions of individuals in over 150 countries have been blessed by the Word of God. Amazing Facts has spawned new spheres of influence in India, Africa, China, and Indonesia. With each new country come hundreds of translated booklets, study guides, and video presentations produced in each region for the people of that region. Armed with these precious truths, gospel workers are empowered to spread bright rays of light on every path they travel. Please visit reachtheworld.amazingfacts.org to learn more about Amazing Facts International and how you can participate in this exciting, soul-winning ministry. That website again is reachtheworld.amazingfacts.org. Thank you for your support. Welcome back, friends. We'd like to welcome you to our Revelation Now. We you all missed a really good blooper. <laughs> Pastor Ross leapt into his chair just before the camera went live. 
<laughs> we were supposed to keep that a secret, Pastor Doug. <laughs> well, it's more fun to share. <laughs> I was trying to get a free offer book, so I'm trying to catch my breath here. Just a reminder, our gift today is entitled Satan in Chains, and this is the free gift that we'd like to make available to those who are watching. If you'd like to receive this, um, all you have to do is <laughs> catch my breath. <laughs> text the word four, uh, text the word chained to 40544, and you'll be able to get a digital copy of the book. If you're outside of North America, just go to the Revelation Now website and you can download the book. Okay, Pastor. So did you run to the back 40? I did run a little way <laughs> searching for the book. <laughs> All right. I well, thought I was going to have to do my Pastor Ross impersonation. <laughs> so. Glad you're here. All right. Questions? Yes. Uh, we have some questions that we'll put up on the screen. Okay. First one is, will the wicked be able to see the righteous people who are inside the New Jerusalem? I believe yes. And... Uh, you know, this is one place where you look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. There is at least a brief period of time where the people who are redeemed can see those who are lost and those who are lost can see those who are redeemed. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a, a great day of reckoning. And uh, it's going to be a, a difficult time. But uh, yeah, I think so. Um, we're all going to be there. Uh, and uh, there's going to be people that we knew that are outside the city um, I think that there's going to be some martyrs in the city. They're going to look outside and they're going to get to see and the, the, the persecutors, the inquisitors, are going to look in the city and say, these are the ones that we tortured. Mm. And there's going to be that contact that's going to happen that's really uh, the justice of God. And that'll occur... It's a vindication. Uh, yeah, that'll occur with the great white throne mm -hmm. judgment scene that we read about. Yeah. So every case will be open for examination of the yes. wicked. So. Mm -hmm. Sobering time. Our next question that we have is, uh, how long will be the time period from the day the holy city descends until the wicked are destroyed uh, by fire from heaven? You know, I'm glad this question's in here. Usually I mentioned it in the lesson I forgot today. Um, we don't know. It says that uh, Satan is loose for a little season. Now, uh, that's an, uh, an unspecific period of time. The closest thing we can find uh, is when uh, it tells us in Hebrews, and I think it's chapter 11, where it says that Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing instead to suffer affliction with the people of God mm -hmm. rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And so for Moses, that season was 40 years of you know leading him from the wilderness to or from Egypt to the promised land. I don't know if there's 40 years. Uh, they have enough time to you know, probably organize. It can't be that long. You know, what are they eating? But I guess they're being sustained by just the power of God. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there is a time in the Bible, and I forget the prophecy reference, Pastor Ross, where it says people will seek death and they can't find it. So during the millennium, those that are, um, uh, those that are resurrected by the Lord, they're just sustained spiritually by God's power during that time. I don't know if they're going to be able to engage in farming and eating and all the things we normally do. The verse you're referring to, I think, is Revelation chapter 9, verse 6. Okay. It talks about a time when people are seeking death. Um, we have another question, and that is, and we'll put on the screen, how long will be the destruction of the wicked? Oh, sorry, let me read the how long. How will the destruction of the wicked angels and the people affect God? Yeah, well, I, I think after a thousand years of, the Bible says we're judging angels and that we are judging the, the lost, the saints will judge the world that we're, we'll be looking at the records and uh, everybody who knows anybody that isn't in the city will have an opportunity to evaluate the reasons why they did not make it. And we will all come to the place where we are perfectly satisfied that God was loving and just. See, God does not want us entering eternity second-guessing or doubting his goodness, his justice, his love. And so he said, look, I'm going to spread out before you everything I knew and how I dealt with this case. It's called disclosure. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, all these politicians talk about transparency. God is going to be uh, demonstrating the ultimate transparency in that all of the records uh, of the lost are going to be available. Now, we're trusting that all of our sins are under the blood and that he's pressed the delete button by the time we get to heaven. But uh, all of the lost, that's not been the case. And someone else asked, they said, now, Pastor Doug, what if a person lives as a Christian for 40 years and then they turn away from the Lord, they backslide and live for the devil for 40 years? 
do they still have to pay for that first 40 years of sins that they ask God to forgive them for? And my answer would be yes. Because you know the parable in Matthew 18 of the unjust servant, when he would not forgive his fellow servant, mm. his entire forgiveness was revoked. And so uh, some people think, well, I've only got to pay for the sins that remain unforgiven between, you know, last time I sinned and when I die. Some people think like that. And I said, no, you're either saved or lost. Right. And uh, there's no middle ground. Okay, so we have some questions that have been emailed in. Uh, this person is asking, the Bible says all of the islands are going to disappear. Uh, is this going to happen when Jesus comes or sometime after that? Yeah, a lot of our friends that uh, live on, uh, you know, South Pacific, Hawaii, they're thinking, oh, we're in trouble. What, what's, what are we going to do? I, if you're saved, don't worry. Hmm. If you're not saved, you've got bigger worries than how's the island going to survive. Uh, if you're saved, when the Lord comes, we're caught up. I think the earthquake that swallows up the islands happens you know, shortly after the saints are all caught up. So don't worry that God's going to have to pluck you from the ocean somewhere as you bob around. He's gonna, you have nothing to worry about if you're saved. I can promise you that. Okay. Somebody's asking a um, good question. Why did Jesus allow the demons to possess the pigs? And they're referring to the story of the, yeah, the demoniac. I'm glad they asked that too because people always have that lingering question. You read the rest of the story and people say, well, I think Matthew tells us that there was a herd of 2,000 swine. So when the devil said to Jesus, we are legion, someone figured there may have been up to 2,000 devils in this man because all the pigs were possessed. And, um, and they went berserk, and just like an avalanche of pork chops, they just went running off the cliff <laughs> and tumbled off and drowned in the Sea of Galilee. Now keep in mind, the Sea of Galilee, three-quarters of it is surrounded by Jewish territory. Pigs are unclean. The Sea of Galilee is not that big. If you want to talk about a toxic spill for a Jew, <laughs> then you throw 2,000 pigs into the Sea of Galilee. And when these bloated pig carcasses began washing up on the shores of Tiberias and Capernaum and Cana, all these cities, they're going, what happened? The story of Jesus saving that man went, that's why it's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke. This was a, a national event. Mm -hmm. Jesus crossed the ocean, he saves one man, turns him into an evangelist, and... The reason they all know the story is because the people who kept the pigs, the demons thought, oh, we're going to destroy all their pigs and all these people will turn away. The pigs ended up being the reason a lot of people turned to the Lord when they wondered what happened. It drew attention to the story. By the way, God doesn't want us raising pigs for food and that's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So he said, you're better throwing that out of the fridge into the lake. Okay. <laughs> so. All right, somebody's asking, is the thousand years prophetic years another good question you know when we're studying bible prophecy and we're getting to more of the prophecies this week by the way don't miss our, our coming presentation wednesday no meeting tomorrow we're giving everyone election day off a day to pray maybe fast and pray for our country and vote and um, but uh then we do have a meeting wednesday night we're going to be talking about the sanctuary and the temple hmm. uh, being rebuilt and you don't want to miss that but we have studies talking about time prophecies wednesday night and you'll know in time prophecy, a day equals a year. So someone's wondering if that thousand years, if it's a spiritual thousand years, really means 360 days in a Jewish year, that'd be 360,000 years. I don't mind if it is, if we're living and reigning with Christ. But I think it's a literal thousand years because it has literally been uh, 6,000 years roughly, when I say literal, the real years from the time of creation till our present day, then it's like a thousand year Sabbath that we spend with the Lord. Now, I, we don't know when Jesus is coming. No man knows the day or the hour. But we're sort of living at the end of that 6,000 years of uh, epics. And um, when the earth will then rest for a thousand years. So I think it's a literal thousand year. The other reason is, um, now where's a verse where it says, time will be no more, or there'll be delay no longer a in uh, Revelation and it makes it sound like from this point on, once we enter eternity, God doesn't use the day for a year prophecy um, method anymore. It's day, years or years at that point. Okay, yeah. very good. Uh, the verse you're referring to, Pastor Doug, I believe is in Revelation chapter 10, yes. talking about the little book. Yeah, that's right. Um, here's probably one of my favorite questions that's come in. I've never seen this one before. Um, this person asks, if we are going to be young in the kingdom of heaven, 
Why does the Bible speak of 24 elders? <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's, that's cute. I have never heard that one before either. <laughs> you know, I remember when I first became a Christian, I was kind of surprised that the, the church said, uh, Doug, I was in my 20s. They said, we'd like to make you an elder. I said, don't rush me. <laughs> I'm in my 20s. I don't want to be elder. Elder Doug. And I used to, uh, you know, no disrespect intended, but when the Mormon missionaries would come around, they all wear the little badges. And, you know, they do this when they're sometimes in their early 20s or late teens. It says Elder Smith and Elder Jones. I'm going, Elder? They've barely grown a mustache. And so <laughs> when you, you think about elder, you think it, it, the word is presbytros. And it usually in the Bible, it means a person. I think there's a the feminine version of it too. It means a person of age and experience. That's where you get the Presbyterian church. It was led by the elders. Mm. And so uh, when it says they're elders, it doesn't mean that they look old. It means they are people who have great experience with God. Mm -hmm. And even Job talks about the elders in heaven. So yeah. um, it goes back to Sons always. of God around the throne of God. Yeah, that's right. Okay, another question that we have. When does this tribulation take place that the Bible speaks about in relation well, to the second coming? Yes. Now, so... And we've got studies coming on this, so please. Did I mention if you were going to miss anything, you should have missed the former lessons. Don't miss <laughs> anything else from here on. Um, the tribulation is a time that begins when the beast power is going to compel religious laws that will force us to choose between keeping the commandments of God or the commandments of men. And of course, Peter says we ought to obey God rather than man. And if we do not obey the, the, there's going to be a political religious organization. Um, the nations of the world will never merge as one nation. Daniel tells us that in Daniel chapter 2. But there will be a religious confederacy that's going to happen. And uh, everyone out of fear is going to be making religious laws, these leaders, and they're going to tell us how to worship. And the beast power will be behind that. If we don't cooperate, they'll say you can't buy or sell. Now that shouldn't surprise us because right now even governments issue sanctions where people cannot, countries cannot buy or sell. But then it will be on a personal level. And I think we all know that uh, we're, we're on the verge of digital currency. Most people don't even use cash anymore. And uh, it'll be very easy to control buying and selling. And then there'll finally be a, um, and that's called the small time of trouble. The big time of trouble is when they, they uh, initiate a death decree. At that point, the seven last plagues fall that is the big time of trouble, and it's going to be extremely severe. Blood and men scorch with great heat. Fresh water turns to blood and noisome sores, and that's the great time of trouble such as has not been since men were upon the earth. So terrible a time and so great. Okay. So, Very good. We got another question, Pastor Doug. Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions, but in Isaiah 65 it says we will build houses and dwell in them. Can you explain? Yes, you will have a city home that God builds for you in the New Jerusalem. Uh, it may be a multi-level city. Uh, you know, all I know is God says that you can't imagine. Now, keep in mind, in a Jewish wedding, when uh, a man proposed to a young lady and there was an agreement with the families and she accepted the proposal, he then would go to his father's house and build a wedding chamber, the honeymoon chamber there. And... Uh, when it was complete, he would come and get his bride and take her back to the honeymoon chamber that had been built, usually adjoining to their main home of the father. So that's the language Christ is using of a, of a marriage. And you don't have to worry that Jesus will forget us any more than a groom would forget his bride after he builds a honeymoon um, house. And so we got a city home, but then we're going to, he'll say, go forth, explore the earth. The redeemed will and the meek will inherit the earth. It says we will then build houses and the same way that uh, Joshua divided the promised land for the Israelites, God is somehow going to divide the uh, world made new to the, with the 144,000 and the great multitude and we're going to have our, our places and spaces and plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them and build houses and, and uh, it says every man under his vine and his fig tree. So we'll have a country home, which I'm looking forward to. Okay. Um, another question's come in. It says, at what time of earth's history will the Holy Spirit be withdrawn from the earth? You know, uh, there'll be a period where probation closes probably immediately after the small time of trouble. During the small time of trouble, 
uh, God's people are going to be persecuted. We can't buy ourselves, but we'll still be preaching. Jesus said, you'll be brought before kings and rulers to give a testimony. And he said, don't worry. In that hour, the Holy Spirit will tell you what you need to say. And people will still be converted during that time. And some Christians whose faith is not rooted well, they're going to give up their faith. So during the small time of trouble, people are still being moved by the Holy Spirit to take a stand or to, they're going to be laboring with temptation to lose their faith. And uh, at that time, I think that uh, at the end of that, the Holy Spirit is finally withdrawn and it's going to, the inhabitants of the earth that are lost are going to be fully under the control of demons. Mm -hmm. How would the God's righteous, people sealed. they'll still have the Holy Spirit though during yes, that time. Yes, we'll be sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, another question that's coming. Uh, you mentioned a few weeks ago, or a few weeks, few presentations ago, about um, what happens to a person when they die. And this question is, what about the verse that says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? How do you answer this? Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, Paul is, you know, Paul is in and out of jail for his faith. Uh, I think he knows his days are numbered. And he says, you know, I could wish that I might depart and be with the Lord but it's needful that I'm with you, that I can, you know, serve you. And he says, absent from the body, I'd rather be, you know, absent from the body and present with the Lord. If a believer dies, their next conscious thought is the resurrection, their glorified body, and they're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So uh, a thousand years might go by from the time that, you know, uh, John Huss died, or somebody in history I'm trying to pick. And... Um, they died a martyr from the time they closed their eyes. For them, it just... Uh, have you ever had uh, a hard, long day of work and uh, you take a hot shower and you get into bed and you're exhausted and you close your eyes, all of a sudden you hear the alarm ring and you think, oh, I for what's that doing ringing? And you think that you've slept three minutes and it's actually been seven hours. Uh, it's been a while since I had a night like that, but <laughs> I remember having, when I was a teenager, I woke up once, I'd slept 10 hours, and I thought it was 10 minutes. Well, that's how it's going to be. Uh, life is still going on here on earth, but for the dead, there's no consciousness of time. Mm -hmm. So you can rejoice for your loved ones that die in Jesus, because their next conscious thought is his presence. But it hasn't happened yet. They're not up there looking down on you. Okay. Uh, another question. In heaven, there is no nights. Does this mean we won't need to sleep in heaven? I don't think we're going to need to sleep because we're exhausted. I do think that we're going to rest. It says they'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. We'll always have energy to do whatever we want to do. But I think there'll also be times of rest. The Bible says there's a Sabbath in heaven mm -hmm. in Isaiah 66. Mm -hmm. That it tells us that from month to month and from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come and worship before the Lord. Not just Jews, all flesh. Part of the Sabbath is resting. And I think there will be days and probably it, it tells us that the light of the sun there, and I think we referenced this before, will be like the light of, uh, it'll be seven times brighter. And the light of the, uh, at night there will be like the light of the sun today. So there will be brighter and darker times. And I think during the dark times, we might want to go out in our country home and lay in a hammock made of vines and take a little snooze. Nothing wrong with that. And just rest. Say, I'm in heaven forever. I never have to worry again. Never have a nightmare. It'll be wonderful. All right. Somebody's at This is a common question that we get. Uh, what does the Bible say about cremation? Is it biblical? Yeah, well, that's connected with the subject we had on death. You know, um, most of the time in the Bible when somebody died, uh, they had a typical burial. Tells us Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were buried. Jacob was actually embalmed by Joseph in Egypt. And then he was buried in the promised land. Joseph was embalmed in Egypt and carried to Israel and buried in Ephraim. David was buried. The kings were buried. There's a couple of exceptions. Uh, you do find where King Saul died and the Philistines had uh, taken his body and mutilated it. Well, the men of Jabesh Gilead rescued his remains and that of his sons that had been killed. And they cremated them. They burned them. And then they buried their, their bones. And, and uh, Saul probably lost, but Jonathan, his son, is probably saved from what we read in the Bible. Cremation does not pre prevent a person from being saved. During the Dark Ages, uh, sometimes Christians were burnt at the stake for their faith. Mm 
Uh, that doesn't prevent the Lord. Some people say, well, how is he going to find all the parts and put them back together again? God's making them new. Old things are passed away. All things are made new. And so we don't need to worry that God can't raise us. But typically in the Bible, because the Protestants usually took the position, because man was made in the image of God, that even in death we bore the divine similitude, so that, that form should be respected. But when you die, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, eventually, unless a person goes to special measures, you're going to turn back into the elements of the earth. Okay. Very good. Another question that's come in. Uh, what does the Bible have to say about divorce and remarriage? It seems that it's so common today, even in the church. Yeah, good question. And, um, well, you know, we mentioned in, I think, our opening presentation that back in the 1800s, there was only one divorce for 30, I think it was 35 marriages, or it was even better than that. It might have been one divorce for 50 marriages. Very rare. And then it's progressively gotten worse over time. And, uh, you know, in the, uh, it seems like in the 60s, it, it ended up getting really bad. Mm -hmm. The 70s, everyone was liberated and they got quickie marriages and quickie divorces and uh, got to where 50% of the people that got married got divorced. Statistics are actually improving. And the statistics among Christians that go to church are even better. But I, personally, I think it's because um, the values of the covenant that we make with God and the misconceptions about what love is. Love is not uh, the mushy feelings that people see in a Hallmark movie. Uh, love is actually a commitment, mm. a decision. And uh, you need to love a person that may not always be lovable. Otherwise, Karen would have never loved me. <laughs> but, but you've made a decision. It's a covenant before God. And, um, and so I think that's one reason. The only biblical grounds for divorce, according to Jesus, in Matthew 5, I think it's repeated in Matthew 19, is it says, saving for the cause of fornication. And so if those vows have been violated, there's grounds, but God, that doesn't mean we have to get divorced. I think we had a book people can even request on this if they've got questions on it called Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they can read that one online, so they'll have to go to the website and look it up. Mm -hmm. Again, just go to the Amazing Facts website. And uh, a number of the resources that we talk about here are available. So if you want to go to the website, you'll be able to look that up, amazingfacts.org or dot com. Mm -hmm. Well, Pastor Doug, looking at the time, you probably don't have time for another um, question, but we've got a lot happening, not tomorrow night, but Wednesday and then all the way through the weekend, some very important subjects that are coming up. And Wednesday Best evening, is yet to come. That's right. You're going to be talking about a temple. A lot of people are wondering about a temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem. So you're going to be talking about that on Wednesday evening. It's Mysteries of the Sanctuary. We'll be unpacking that. And you're going to be amazed at what we can learn from... Um, the three sanctuaries in the Bible mm. and how Jesus reveals the plan of salvation, some of the secrets of that in that, um, in that study. Okay. Again, it's not too late to invite your friends. You can Amen. tell them to join us as we're getting to the meat of these presentations. And of course, no program tomorrow evening, but we'll meet again on Wednesday evening.